discuss much among psychiatrists ourselves. In fact, we do not have a chapter of adult ADI, uh, ADSD. So I was very surprised that I got to speak on this chapter. So uh, first of all, uh, uh, I'll say that usually ADSD has been known as a disease of childhood. But now we know that there is a spillover in adults also. And there were certain cohort studies which have been done in England, in Brazil, which actually showed that adult ADSD can arise de novo without any symptoms being present in childhood. So if you look at this uh, chart, uh, most of the cases are spillover from the childhood. There can be uh, adult onset uh, ADSD where we do not have any symptoms in childhood and there can be a true adult onset ADSD where due to new neurodegenerative conditions, symptoms of impulsivity, hyperactivity can arise de novo. Uh, what we know is that if you can look at this chart that ADHD is most prevalent between 6 to 12 years of age and after that it gradually abates as we become adults. Also if you can see in this chart that combined and hyperactive type of ADHD predominates more in childhood and later on as we become adults the inattentive type and the mixed type of ADHD combined type of ADHD is the one which becomes more prominent. Overall, the incidence decreases, but around 5% of the adult population also keep complaining of symptoms of ADSD. Excuse me. Yeah. ADSD is a problem of the prefrontal cortex. You have a typical trio of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. The symptoms arise due to inefficient information processing in the prefrontal cortex. You have the inattentive symptoms where you have problems with sustaining your attention. You have executive dysfunction which is related to dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and this is a new concept that is coming up and to understand ADSD and to diagnose it you have to understand the pathophysiology that lies behind the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Also. Uh, uh, many times you have seen that family members come up and says he, he can uh, give attention to things which he likes but when I say something he doesn't give attention. So you have to remember that there is something which is also called as selective attention and that is again subsided by a very interesting area which is called as the dorsal anterior uh, uh, cingulate cortex and that is also intimately related to especially the adult ADSD and not so much in the child ADSD which is the major difference between child and adult ADSD. So to summarize you have the dorsal anterior cingulate circuit which is for selective attention, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex which is for sustained attention, the impulsive symptoms which are from the orbitofrontal cortex and the premotor motor areas where the hyperactive symptoms are present and usually in adults you see a mix of these symptoms and predominantly in adults the DACC and DLPFC is the area which is more inefficient. As you can see the orbitofrontal cortex is intimately related to the limbic and motor areas also. That is why ADSD is, has to be understood that this is a very very uh, ADSD is a condition which has comorbid uh, other psychiatric illnesses, a uh, lot of them. In fact, a uh, uh, lot of time uh, clinicians see ki we thought ki this was ADSD, then now the presentation is more of anxiety and depression. What you have to understand is that ADSD by nature has a lot of variants. You might have symptoms of anxiety, depression, you might have symptoms of ADSD and in adults they usually mix up and for proper management you have to look at both the symptoms and most of the times treat them simultaneously also. Uh, <clears throat> the executive functioning and the inefficient tuning of information processing in prefrontal cortex, if you talk about, we talked about the neural circuits, the principal neurotransmitters which are involved are the norepinephrine and dopamine. There are other neurotransmitters which are also been now being seen to be implemented, especially the reticular activating system, 
the, uh, uh, and uh, uh, some other neurotransmitters, but principally uh, the norepinephrine and dopamine are the circuits which are primarily responsible for the ADSD disorder. Also to understand the pathophysiology and later the management and why there are so many other comorbid symptoms, what happens is there is a tonic firing in the prefrontal cortex of both dopamine and norepinephrine. So in ADSD, once these neurotransmitters are less, we have a proliferation of the postsynaptic neurotransmitters also. And these proliferation of the postsynaptic neurotransmitters lead to problems with anxiety, with depression, with uh, oppositional defined disorder and other comorbid conditions that are frequently present in ADSD. Mm -hmm. uh, for diagnosis, you have seen this criteria that we take the DSM-5. There is a difference in DSM-5 and DSM-4 which we used to have before. What DSM-5 has done is it has started recognizing adult ADSD. And now it says that for a diagnosing adult ADSD, you do not need to have six uh, uh, symptoms of inattention and six symptoms of hyperactivity. In fact, you might be having four or five symptoms and still you can make a diagnosis of adult ADSD. Earlier, uh, the age criteria was that there has to be some symptoms present before 12 years of age. This has also been now uh, slightly given leverage and uh, now we can consider adult ADSD as 17 years and older. Uh, the other criteria which I am not going to go into detail about like mild types, moderate types, uh, severe types where all the ADSD symptoms are present. What we see mainly in adults are inattention and the combined types of ADSD. Here is the summary of the DSM-5 criteria where uh, uh, these symptoms you have to keep in mind. To make it more simple, what you have to understand is if people with ADSD have problems of inhibition, they have poor self-control and executive dysfunctions. The uh, manifestations can differ. They have problems in school. Now we have problems with uh, offices and sustained attention. Hyperactivity, simply understood is the break is off. You'll see patients will keep on doing certain activities. Once they start talking about the subject, they do not know when to break. Uh, sitting quietly in adult actually does not root out hyperactivity because in, as I said, in adult, Hood, you develop less motor symptoms. Impulsivity, doing something without thinking. Lot of time, the family member says, ye kuch bhi kar dete hai. If something happens, he would be distracted and these patients are very good beginners, but they have a lot of problem time, problems in finishing their tasks. So you can understand why even with normal IQ, with good IQ, these patients have problems in doing good jobs. So the concentration problems in ADSD seems to involve the inability to focus and to give attention appropriately. The problem is not that the patients of ADSD do not know what to do, but the timing for them is mostly wrong. In between a meeting, if some idea comes, they are unable to stop themselves, they'll blurt it out, and this is how it happens. The problem of poor self-control happens a lot of time. You can actually imagine a small child doing something and an adult doing similar things getting fidgety, restless, would become more and more obvious and he would be embarrassed and the problem is happening. Executive dysfunction is you know what to do, but to effectively plan it, to do it, and when to stop when you're doing is a problem in these patients. Most of the times we understand ADSD, okay, these patients are on the go, they have motor hyperactivity, but again, uh, why these ADSD patients have, if, if a diabetic patient has ADSD, you see a lot of time that they are not exercising. They are, th that's why they have like comorbid so many other conditions. They do not remember to take their pills. They are very good at doing tasks like uh, uh, spending time on the internet or surfing the smartphone, mm -hmm. but telling themselves that I need to exercise every day, I need to go do five kilometers or this other things I need to take this is not is a problem for them and that is why medical comorbidities are also worsened in a patient has ADSD. Also many times this is also seen a uh, rejection sensitivity dysphoria. It is uh, uh, ADSD patients have expectations from themselves and from their family and once this is not met 
they have extreme rage and many times they are not able to control it. This comes out as violent behavior towards your colleagues, your spouse, or even towards themselves. And then these patients sometimes get confused with personality disorders also. So you have to understand that this is also seen a lot in ADSD. So poor self-management related to time planning and goal, problems with organizing yourself, poor self-discipline, poor self-motivation and activation because, and all this can lead not only in problems with daily life, with comorbidities also, with medical problems also. And if you talk about domains of impairment, they have impairment in all the domains. Again, as I said, there is a lot of variance seen in ADSD. At one point of time, there will be more problems with certain areas. At other points of time, problems with other areas. And this keeps on happening. What the patients of ADSD lack is they do not have what we call it as mind's eye and mind's voice. They do not have hindsight. They tend to commit the same mistakes again and again. And they do not even have foresight. What happens is ki to plan effectively because of executive dysfunction problems, they cannot see ki what my actions today is going to cause me doing tomorrow. Uh, suppose, uh, I was seeing one person like selling credit cards in the airport. What will happen with an ADSD patient is, he, if he likes something about that credit card, he'll again take it. He'll end up getting 10 credit cards without realizing ki trying to save money, the opposite is happening because that impulse that's come, that is not being able to stop so they are very, very poor planets as regard to money and management. I've already mentioned about comorbidities. In children, you have these kind of comorbidities. Slight change in picture in adults. You have a lot of mood disorders, anxiety disorders. Nicotine addiction is a lot in ADSD, more than half the persons, because nicotine is supposedly activating and they can be actually used as self-medication. And uh, uh, the studies been done which have been shown that anxiety, depression, drug abuse, behavioral and personality issues, and as I mentioned, non-communicable diseases are also more common in ADSD patients because of the lack of motivation to follow through. So, and if they have non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular illnesses, diabetes, hypertension, they tend to manage it also less poorly. I've already mentioned about this circuit how the ventromedial prefrontal cortex linked to the limbic system, which is the emotional area, and that is why you have so many comorbid other psychiatric illnesses also in ADHD. Uh, keeping this in mind, the diagnostic criteria can be very, very much simplified. If you can just ask the patients three questions, one from each domain. First question could be, do you feel restless? This is like hyperactivity. When adults usually complain of restlessness rather than frank hyperactivity of running around. Do you generally feel impulsive? Do you do the first thing that comes to your mind without thinking about the consequences? Or do you generally have problems concentrating? If the patient says yes to these, and if he says that this problem has been there from lifelong, you have to be suspicious about ADSD. If it is situational or if it has just come for some time, that could be bipolar. This is also one of the ways where how you can differentiate other comorbidities like bipolar illness, like personality disorders from ADSD. This uh, uh, chart has been given by Sandra Kui, who's done a lot of work in America on adult ADSD. If you now start suspecting with the clinical symptoms and these rating scales, then you have many rating scales which you can use. And these are easily available on the internet. You can use the adult self-reporting scale, the Connors Adult ADSD Self-Report Scale. Uh, Russell Barclay has written a very, very nice book on adult ADSD, which is a must read for anyone who is interested in ADSD or who or their relatives suffer from it. I have this as a PDF with myself. Anyone interested, I can provide this book to them. Uh, you can ask your psychologist. These are two very, very simple tests that can pick up uh, problems with attention and selective attention. One, it is known as the uh, Stroop task. Here, like you can see that the colors and the spellings are mismatched. You are supposed to read the colors and not what has been written. Uh, if anybody wants to attempt this test, like uh, ADSD people have a lot of problem with this test and this focuses on selective attention. The other test which the psychologists do is an n back test. It is again what happens is ki you are flashed a number. You're supposed to remember this number, and then the next number is flashed, N1. 
and you are supposed to tell the previous number. It is easy for us, but a patient with ADSD does very, very poorly on these two tests and gives an indication for ADSD. How do you manage it? Obviously, a lot of time when you tell the patients you have ADSD, denial as is common with psychiatric illnesses is present, but a lot of time they have a sense of relief and joy, ki, okay, now I understand why I am having these kind of problems. But as I said, since they are very good starters and very poor followers, so this is just the starting and management requires a lot of psychoeducation. In fact, ADHD is one condition where a personal guide or mentor is needed. Many times when I treat the patient, I psychoeducate one family member and designate him as his mentor. And if he's okay with a counselor, it's not that counseling should be done and finished. It should be daily connecting with the psychologist. Instead, that, that there was one Sigmund Freudian way where we used to go into past life. In ADSD management, here and now problems have to be prioritized and there has to be frequent visits to the therapist and the psychologist also. Then, obviously, medications. ADSD is a very, very nice condition to treat because 70 to 80 percent of patients show very good results with the medications which we have with ADSD. And if medication and mentoring is done and if the patient practices regularly, you can have very good results with ADSD. In fact, many better results than have other psychiatric illnesses also. The focus should be on educating. And ADSD patients are, they, they want so much of information about the uh, patients that you will be actually exhausted with this. The psychiatrist has to be supportive. I'll give you an example. Like I remember one patient, you are supposed to come to me at 12. He came at 2 o'clock when I was about to leave and he runs and asked him what happened. He says, time pe to nikla tha. But on the way, I found that there was some, this guy who was selling tarot cards and he wanted to tell me why I'm having the problem, so I stopped. Achha, phir kya hua? Did it take two hours? No, no, no. Then I saw a friend coming. We decided we'll have tea together. So this distractibility is there. And once he comes to you, if you say, no, my time is up, I will not treat you, he has that rejection sensitivity. That's why with ADSD patients, you have to be very supportive. You have to be accommodating and sometimes make sort of small concessions for them for having a better treatment outcome. The, uh, the, uh, the, as I've already mentioned, the treatment should be goal-oriented and solution-focused. There are many websites which provide good information about ADSD. If it becomes exhaustible, you can tell them that they can refer to the child and adult ADSD scale, the, ADD, the ADDDA warehouse and all. These are available on the net free of cost. Lastly, I'll come to the medications. We have the stimulants and the non-stimulants. In India, we, do, we have only availability is of methylphenidate. The methylphenidate comes as an immediate release and a sustained release population. With immediate release, pro uh, uh, the problem is that it acts for only three to four hours. So you need to give the medications for three to four times. And because you're giving these medications frequently, sometimes anxiety builds up. The only thing you need to do is get a cardiovascular checkup done because these medications may give a transient rise to blood pressure, otherwise they are very safe. Sometimes in adults, besides anxiety, psychosis is precipitated, so you have to start low, go slowly, maybe take up to a month for these medications to build up the dosage. The dosage is usually 40 to 60 or around 1 to 1.2 milligram of kg of body weight. <clears throat> the other treatment is the non-stimulants and principally in it is atomoxetin. As I said, atomoxetin, uh, 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 what, what methylphenidate does is acts mainly on the dopamine pathway and secondly on the norepinephrine pathway. Here, opposite happens. This acts more on the norepinephrine pathway, but norepinephrine itself uh, uh, increase leads to, uh, 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 as I said, there was a tonic presence of dopamine and uh, norepinephrine and this receptor uh, sensitivity when it goes down, so secondly, even atomoxetin helps calm down that dopamine pathway. So both of them are effective. In fact, atomoxetin can be better if the patient has secondary comorbidities like depression and anxiety. Atomoxetin, interestingly, was an antidepressant, which was not uh, used much for that indication, but it came to be used more in ADSD. You have other agents also like bupropion, tricyclics, 
which target both the norepinephrine and dopamine pathway. In the tricyclics, we choose agents which are mainly norepinephric for treating adult ADHD. Uh, guanfacin again is not available. Clonidin, which acts on the uh, alpha 2A receptors, also increases norepinephrine and helps in ADSD. In patients who cannot tolerate the other two medicines, this could also be an option. Last, to summarize, ADSD is a difficult, uh, it's uh, considered to be a disease of childhood, but now it's been understood that adult ADSD is a substantial condition which we are now gradually getting aware of. It is a difficult problem because there are a lot of variants and there are a lot of comorbidities. But if you treat it well, the results which we get with ADSD are excellent, in fact, better than other psychiatric conditions. Thank you.